Um, and now to introduce two of our guests today, Shadi Gahari and Lucas Kane. Shadi is a theater director, choreographer, and writer from Tehran, Iran, based in New York City. She graduated from Yale School of Drama with an MFA in directing, and she has been co-artistic director of Yale Summer, Summer Cabaret Program, assistant director of Yale Repertoire Theater, and co-curator of Amru's Festival, as well as the Immigrant Mix Fest at Atlantic Theater Company. She was the directing fellow, fellow at Rattlestick Playwright Theater in 2018, and the winner of a director designer showcase at Opera America in 2019. For several years, she has been also doing theater workshops with refugee children from Afghanistan. Lucas Kane is a film theater, film and theater maker whose work ranges from documentary and film, documentary and experimental film to community-based forum theater. After graduating with a degree in cultural anthropology, he moved to Ecuador to complete a series of short documentary films on topics ranging from traditional weaving practices to male sex work. Inspired by the vibrant tradition of street theater, he returned to New York to further develop his craft in theater, film, and photography, and he currently works as assistant director to Peter Brook and Marie Helen Estienne. And now I'll hand it off to Lucas to introduce Brian. All right, thank you so much. So um, Brian Doris is a writer, director, and translator who currently serves as artistic director to Theater of War Productions. He is a self-described evangelist for ancient stories and the relevance to our lives today. Theater of War Productions uses these age-old approaches to help individuals and communities heal from trauma and loss. And during his tenure, tenure at Theater of War, the company has presented dramatic readings of seminal plays and community conversations to confront topics such as combat-related psychological injury, end-of-life care, police and community relations, prison reform, gun violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, the refugee crisis, and addiction. And so a very short list of these productions and places uh, include performing Brian's own translations of Sophocles' Ajax and Philoctetes to military personnel at bases throughout this country, the Middle East, as well as Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, performing Prometheus Bound to incarcerated folks and correctional officers in minimal and maximum security prisons throughout the country, doing an adapted version of the Book of Job to communities devastated by natural disasters in places like Joplin, Missouri, and Fukushima, Japan, and uh, he did a production in collaboration with members of the community of Ferguson called Antigone and Ferguson, designed to open up a conversation about police violence, institutional racism, and the immense questions surrounding justice. A production which toured this country, uh, performing at Michael Brown's own high school, the Harlem stage here in New York, as well as Athens, Greece, and many more. Theater of War has presented to over 150,000 people and has over 20 different types of productions. They have a very long list of production, uh, participating actors, including Samira Wiley, Cynthia Nixon, Paul Giamatti, Francis McDormand, Adam Driver, and many more. And so I just kind of wanted to begin also by just describing uh, what a production often looks like and then pass it off to Brian and Shadi. And so often your productions include a few different at three or four actors uh, on a panel reading from the scripts uh, extremely energetically with lots of emotion. And then after about an hour to 40, um, an hour, an hour, 40 minutes of this reading, you open it up for a, a discussion, which often includes very vulnerable um, discussions about, about the topics at hand. Um, so Brian, with that said, we wanted to welcome you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I guess the, the last thing that I'll say is that we're all learning how to navigate Zoom and how to make this the most interesting and effective way possible. And something that I really appreciate about your practice is how you kind of center process and you don't hide it and you center mistakes and you say that that allows us to be more vulnerable in, in the space. So that, that may be happening here today, um, but we'll just keep that part of the process. And also we're hoping to hear from the audience as much as possible. And we've thought that we'll just field questions after about 20 or 30 minutes of us talking in the chat. And then at the last 10 minutes, we thought if there's anybody with a really burning question who'd like to talk directly to Brian, they can do that through the, the video function. All right, so thanks again, Brian. Perfect, thanks so much for having me um, on your, your Zoom. Um, Shadi and uh, Lucas, it's really uh, wonderful to be with you and everyone else. As you mentioned before, um, our model is based on um, 
the virtue of making mistakes. And um, I, I think um, the more mistakes we make, uh, the more we empower other people to take the risk of making mistakes. And in some ways, I think that cuts to the heart of what Greek tragedy is about. Um, the center of Greek tragedy, uh, you know, Aristotle's interpretation is this word hamartano. Um, in Greek, it means to miss the mark. And I miss the mark about a thousand times each day. It's how I learn, it's how I adapt. Um, missing the mark later becomes translated as the tragic flaw um, with all its moral weight. Um, but I like to strip back the idea and approach the idea of missing the mark without moral judgment. So I hope we'll make a lot of mistakes and then we'll learn from them. Um, with that, I know you guys had some questions. I'm delighted to talk about whatever, whatever suits yeah. your fancy. Thank you so much. Uh, we are so excited to have you and thank you everyone else who had made the time to be here with us. We are so excited to have a um, um, provocative and exciting conversation around um, uh, Brian's work and um, just maybe we can say uh, at the core Greek tragedy. Um, so uh, we are really um, were fascinated by complexity of your work like as any theater piece will be like um, um, meant to be something based on um, who's in the room, who's on the stage, who's the audience, what location you're doing at what time you're doing it and what story, there will be to totally different pieces. And that, that element of theater, it looks like with your pieces are even more at state, like at uh, core of it and like always like butterflies in stomach to see what's gonna happen next. And something that stuck for me and Lucas and we wanted to just put that on the table and chat about it is um, when you say to your actors, your collaborators, make the audience wish they have never come. <laughs> and I really want you to go about what really this means and how much this provokes your performers and the space that you are um, facilitating. Thank you so much, Shadi. It's a terrific question. Um, Early in our work, which was for audiences in hospitals, the U.S. military, prisons, for ex uh, communities that experience trauma, mental health issues, um, and other related, also physical uh, challenges, um, I thought that our work was about, I, I assumed our work was about empathy. And people talk about that word a lot. It's kind of a, it's a neologism, less than 150 years old, a kind of creation of psychology in the late 19th century. Um, you know, in other words, it doesn't have a lot of weight, um, but it's a word that we throw around quite a bit. And I thought the work was about empathy until, I don't know, about a hundred performances in, when um, I began to discover that empathy may have been a byproduct of what we were after in engaging audiences in these really challenging conversations by way of ancient stories about the present moment. But in fact, the most useful tool that we could apply to open up those discussions was shared discomfort. And by that, I mean creating the conditions where we come together as a community and uh, it could be on Zoom, I, I, it could be in a physical room, but that we come together as a community and as a species, uh, we acknowledge and, 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 and face some of the hardest parts of what it means to be human um, as a community. And so to that end, if I have an actor, like some of the actors you mentioned, uh, about to go on stage, often I will whisper into that actor's ear, um, listen, I have a note for you, make them wish they'd never come. Because what I'm actually asking them to do is to commit to the, what's required of Greek tragedy, an emotional commitment that exceeds and goes beyond, if we do it correctly, if we really commit to it, what is, consumable, you know, um, what, what, what you, one could go and say, well, I had that experience and now I've checked that box and I've consumed it. But if the actor pushes past that place to something that's actually borderline inappropriate in any setting that makes us hopefully all feel so uncomfortable that for maybe just a few seconds, we're all scanning for the exits, thinking about how we might leave the space because we're so uncomfortable. Well, then something really productive can happen because after the performance, as Lucas mentioned, we then have a discussion that lasts longer than the performance. And in that discussion, we can actually interrogate why we were so uncomfortable. 
And um, for me, I, I was led to this work by my own uh, experiences as a caregiver, um, confronted when my girlfriend was dying of cystic fibrosis in 2003, with the limits of my own compassion, with my ambivalence and feeling helpless in the face of another person suffering, um, with uh, my own discomfort at what I perceive to be my own moral failings. And there's something about an actor going to a place of such extremity that creates the conditions where we can step back from ourselves and acknowledge and interrogate why we're so uncomfortable. And for me, that's far more productive than thinking about compassion or empathy. Yeah, uh, that's, that's beautiful. And that strikes me as a very uh, completely different relationship to how you view your audience than I would say like mainstream theater does. And I think that it like gets at a, you have a completely different goal. I would, I would argue that I often feel like the goal of, of mainstream theater is to, is to be in that kind of comfortable entertainment empathy space where you're pushing past that. But I, I have a, a question about like, how do you navigate making like, I guess handling like, like holding that space of uncomfort when it's happening, especially like if in your audience you have people who have directly suffered from police violence and police officers. I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm kind of curious if you can elaborate on, on what it takes to facilitate that space and to hold that space and like the intensity that's gonna just erupt out of that. It takes a tremendous amount of reassurance on the part of the facilitator. And it's not always me. We have a cadre of really remarkable facilitators who are actually of some of the communities for whom we perform. So veterans, formerly incarcerated individuals, formerly gang affiliated individuals um, who, who are up there with me, activists, and sometimes on their own, reassuring the audience that we as adults and children can come together and it may be uncomfortable and it may be activating and we may feel emotions that we didn't expect to feel but that if we make the commitment to stay in the room and to face it together, even if we don't agree, um, something productive can happen. And um, I think, you know, I don't mean to diminish the potential for unintended consequences, for secondary trauma, for activating people beyond what, you know, is healthy. But by using an ancient story and an ancient play and not a photo realistic depiction of violence or trauma, we try to create some distance wherein the audience can then step back and not feel accused. We're not saying to them, this is you. We're asking them to reflect, what do you see of yourself in this ancient story? And that creates a far less defensive posture for everyone, no matter where they fall on the spectrum, politically, socially, hierarchically. And the beautiful thing is our work isn't about affixing one interpretation to the play. What we're doing is acknowledging the infinite possibility of interpretation in a room. And anyone, anyone can have an interpretation. And in some ways, there's no way to invalidate another person's interpretation because it's theirs. And so in our model, we can create the space where I'm not validating necessarily your political perspective. I don't have to agree with your political right, but I can validate your interpretation. I can say, wow, I never thought of it that way. Or, boy, uh, that took bravery and courage to say, because it's not a very popular thing to have voiced in this community at this moment in time. And that can become very productive. The most productive things that get said in the discussions are the most uncomfortable truths or the things that are repugnant. You know, there's even room within our discussions for people to say things that are repugnant repugnant to me, repugnant to other people. And that becomes productive because we can acknowledge the very things that were already in the room. And I guess I would say, Lucas, we're not, I, you know, people talk about safe space. I'm not sure there's any way to ensure safety, especially right now. Mm -hmm. But I do think um, it's possible to create brave spaces where people are encouraged to take risks and to be themselves. Um, so a lot of our work takes place for very politically diverse audiences everywhere from you know, universities to the middle of red state America to, you know, to military bases and prisons. And the net effect of these performances is to create this 
space where we're all just interpreting a play together. I guess one question that I, as like a younger theater artist director, have for you and really truly like um, um, decided to become a theater director to tell stories that we were for years and years like um, asked not to tell and, and your uh, theater feels very close to I, I don't know what to call the other thing, but like the conversation, what you are like wanting that conversation part to do to uh, the community. Um, I wonder like, um, how do you go about um, um, the line? Do, is there any line between the 40 minutes of the reading for you to be called something like theater and then like the one hour after that, the conversation something else? Or are you calling this whole thing, the whole theatrical experience? Does it matter really? I really don't know, yeah. but it's an interesting like subject. So from my perspective, from the company's perspective, it's one thing. Um, the principal experiment of the 20th century and into the 21st century in theater globally has been to erase the audience. There have been some moments here and there in the 60s and 70s and even in the present moment where we've subverted that experiment. But the primary idea is we go to a theater where we are plunged into darkness and we are erased from the experience. And then in most theatrical experiences now, there's a legislated moment where there's a discussion afterwards, um, which is called, unfortunately, in most settings, a talk back. And for me, a talk back is kind of, a, the idea of a talk back is kind of an obscenity. It, implicit in, his, in the word talk back is, how dare you talk back? <laughs> How dare you speak? Um, and so one of the core values of what we do is um, rather than presuming that we're in the position to teach didactically an audience or even that there's anything intrinsically valuable to culture itself and sharing with that audience, um, our hierarchy, our values are kind of inverted. And the question we're asking is what happens when you approach an audience with reverence for the talent for the experience, for the intelligence that's in every room, and what new things are possible when you create a platform where you can pass the microphone, so to speak, to people, especially who have lived through some of the experiences these plays describe, and empower them to be the ones who are speaking. Far more performative, far more thrilling, I think, for most of our audiences than these amazing performances by these incredible actors are these um, monologues and soliloquies and statements and questions that come up out of people, many of them not educated, many of them never having heard of a Greek play, and the beauty, the prosody, the rhetoric, the um, cohesiveness of what they say almost inevitably always exceeds the power of the play itself. And um, this is the most exciting part for me because that's the real performance when people take that risk of speaking their truths and finding a vernacular in the moment to express it, however imperfect. And um, that's the electrifying thing that pulls all of the pieces together. Um, and our experiment is, is about undoing the experiment of the 20, 20th century. Um, let's leave the lights on. Let's invite people as they come into the space to be themselves. Let's not uh, antagonize people with a front of house staff that officiously tells them when to use their cell phones in the bathroom. Let's try to undo all those things in the theater that now accrue to telling people who are not white and are not upper middle class, this is not for you. Mm -hmm. And now once we create that space, and we've had the honor of being able to do it a few times on our own terms, what new things are possible when people are invited to be part of the experience and when people are invited to be themselves? Um, and so that for us, it's one, one, one thing. And the performance isn't over until the last person speaks. And we, haven't, we have done our work, we have known we have done our work when the person who seemed least empowered to be the one who is speaking, the janitor, the food service worker, the usher, 
the person who walked in off the street who experienced homelessness until that person is the one who is speaking until the mic has been passed to the person who regularly would not have be in the position to be speaking. And one thing that's just uh, I'm reminded of is you've said in our conversations that that free tickets is neutral. So that that's the baseline. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about how you do ticketing and how most theaters do ticketing and how that kind of sets up a, a difference. So we don't do ticketing. I feel about ticketing. We feel about ticketing the way we feel about the word talk back. Um, Ticketing is about transaction. Even free things that have tickets are transactional. And if you make something transactional, um, how can we achieve our goal? How can we actually, how can we talk about black and brown suffering if it's transactional? How can we engage in conversations about trauma uh, if people are paying in to consume that experience? And so, but just to back up, and I don't, I don't want to be negative here, but there are a lot of major cultural institutions in New York City and across the country and the world who preach the rhetoric of inclusivity for whom offering free tickets is this thing, you know, that, that proves their merit as, as organizations. And um, our perspective is free as neutral, as you said before, um, unless we're actually working actively to dismantle the systems of oppression that would keep the very audience that we're in interested in engaging from ever engaging with us and with these plays. Um, we can give out all the free tickets we want. It's not a theater for the people, by the people, of the people, as it says on the public theater's banner. It's not radically inclusive. Um, so we spend a good deal of our budget on transportation for audiences. Um, for demographics that we're interested in engaging, um, and also meals. And um, for those or, uh, demographics that we engage, we call them our VIPs. Primarily in New York City, our VIPs are uh, formerly incarcerated, formerly gang affiliated, having experienced homelessness or addiction, living in NYCHA developments, attending Title I schools, the list goes on and on. And we create a new hierarchy when we invite them into the space or we bring it into their space and we say you are the experts we want to hear from you your insights um, you don't have to speak but if you, just by pre your presence in the room listening to this play you are going to attune people who haven't experienced gun violence or mental health or trauma or poverty or incarceration to what's important about this exchange just by the way you're breathing and um, so this question of curating audiences with skin in the game and going well beyond the model, because again, it's just about this question of who is bestowing the gift. Mm -hmm. I, I think in our culture of you know, people who make culture, who are engaged in this process of making culture, we assume that we're the shamans bestowing the gift of culture upon audiences. But what if the audience is really in the position to bestow the gift upon us? And what are we missing when we don't have reverence for what the audience is bringing uh, to the equation? I love when you say uh, free is neutral. I really do love that. I just think um, uh, making, as you said, like we can't make a safe space, but like making neutral space is very, very difficult as well. Because um, um, inviting like one, one Why, question that this I emergency <laughs> I I think I accidentally I was back. I, I think we're back. <laughs> that was that was my that was a big mistake. That was a big mistake. Okay, you're a fan of mistakes. So Congratulations, fine. Lucas. That was amazing. We actually Thanks heard from everyone at once. I just thought we'd make it a little bit more vulnerable for a second. There. <laughs> Sorry, Shadi. Um, example of mistake. Um, so yeah. um, I was gonna say, um, I believe like when you when you make a space, as as you said, free ticketing and making space for people who would not have been in theater space if, if it wasn't for that reason. Um, and when you take the same uh, projects different places 
then like what happens to your work like for example let's just like for example say a piece that you have been doing in a space that was free ticket for everyone and now you take the same piece uh, to a like more luxurious theater in new york and your your audience has changed do have you seen like like i am wondering about examples of the same thing failing in a different space have you seen um places that the thing actually didn't meant to uh, the turnout didn't meant to be what you were hoping for just because the audience has changed um yes there have been many many epic failures over the span of the last 12 years um all of which have been instructive um we always are learning from the audience and also learning from our mistakes about audience curation um uh set and setting has a huge impact on how people receive the text and the performance. And so coming into a cultural space where they don't feel welcome, for instance, for some audiences can be the really decisive in framing how audiences might interpret an experience. If you're passing bulletproof glass in a security apparatus to get to the theater, like you would at most theaters, um, and you've had interactions with the police and with the incarceral state that haven't been particularly positive, well then, it's already being interpreted for you to a certain extent, the experience of the theater. Mm -hmm. So we've learned a lot about the challenges of performing in institutional spaces. And for us, the sweet spot, the most powerful and the most helpful place to do our work is not in theaters. It is in places where, that are not overdetermined and loaded with all the cultural baggage of how we're supposed to behave in those spaces um, in the cultural world. And so homeless shelters are, are I would say, among the top uh, in our preference where things go from zero to a thousand almost immediately and a radical candor can be achieved in a very short period of time where the audience is fully aware of the fragility of human life, of happiness, of the possibility of safety and we can get to a conversation that's really meaningful. In institutions, um, that is often very challenging. We're working against the institutions, which, um, which are, um, as we've learned, unfortunately, over the span of our working, um, even institutions that um, claim to be radical or engaged with um, questions of equity, um, because of the entrapments of things like security and transactional tickets and um, uh, the didactic nature of just museums um, are um, uh, inherently, they are an extension of the very system of oppression that we are trying to address with our work. Um, so set and setting has a huge impact. T to your question, Shadi, just briefly, we had a recent performance um, that was uh, particularly instructive. Um, we were commissioned to do a project based on Peter Weiss's play, The Investigation, which is a piece of documentary theater from 1965 based on the Frankfurt Auschwitz War. Oh no, did Brian just, did Brian just vanish? Um, I vanished. Okay, here you're back. You're back. Yes, you're back. I, I reapparated. <laughs> um, I'm reading Harry Potter with my daughter. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so um, we did this performance uh, that was commissioned by the Museum of Jewish Heritage, uh, and we decided we said to them, "We'll do a, pr pr a production of um, the investigation, which is a piece of documentary theater based on transcripts from these war crimes trials from Auschwitz." Um, only if we can try to dehistoricize and, and, and widen the perspective of the discussion that would come out of it by engaging other communities that have experienced um, state violence, uh, uh, oppression, um, other types of anal analogous experiences, not the same obviously as the Holocaust, but related that we may be perpetrating right now by being complicit in those systems. So we did two performances, one in Brooklyn at a church where we invited um, the theater of war uh, productions sort of event right distribution list, which is over 20,000 people who sort of loyally come to our projects. They're 60 to 75% of color 
They hit all the demographics that we're really after. And of course, that night in Brooklyn, the audience reflected those demographics, as did the cast, which included several Rwandan genocide survivors. Jamani Williams, our public advocate, played one of the roles. This was not a straight performance, you know, attempting any kind of verisimilitude with, you know, German SS officers. Um, and so, and then of course the panel also reflecting a diversity of experience, um, this community panelists, including Holocaust survivors and, um, and uh, also uh, p survivors of domestic violence and um, other things. And, and, and so the discussion in that Brooklyn performance of this incredibly challenging piece of material that has really no silver lining. It's, it's like, it's an exploration of Hannah Arendt's notion of sort of the banality of evil like how, how it's not just people, but really systems and structures and hierarchies that often we feel helpless to change that we are complicit in just for our survival and the well-being of our family that result in this kind of massive scale state violence against groups of people. And the play has no silver lining and it's, you know, it ends in the ovens. It's, it, you know, um, uh, turned into a conversation in Brooklyn where there were members of the African American community in Brooklyn that we had engaged with Antigone and Ferguson and members of the Jewish community, which as you know, of late in Crown Heights and other places have had real tensions, physically getting up and hugging each other and crying on each other's shoulders in a way that sounds hyperbolic, um, but actually happened. Um, really you know, being able to talk about the legacy of slavery and intergenerational trauma and what's the half-life of trauma and you know the, the challenge of thinking outside of your own trauma to imagine the experience of another person's trauma and why we get competitive in our trauma and all these things began to be discussed really powerfully we did a second performance at the Museum of Jewish Heritage we didn't do the appropriate outreach to the community that we had tapped in Brooklyn here we were in an institutional setting, mostly Jewish audience that comes to the museum as a memorial to Auschwitz and to the Holocaust during the Auschwitz exhibit. And the discussion descended into screaming amongst members of the audience and racial epithets being said quietly and also loudly across the space and um, got very, very heated and intense. And the question of the appropriation of the Holocaust um, to the sort of rel to relativize it to be the same as children at our border, or you know, was a really um, tense topic among people who are experiencing violence in their own communities right now, anti-Semitism in their own communities right now, and without a chorus of people, a larger chorus of people with more diversity in the room and more skin in the game with regard to the other types of issues we'd hope to talk about, the conversation could only go so far. I still really enjoyed it. It was really, really uncomfortable. I think it unearthed a lot of fissures within the community for whom we were performing that was productive to unearth and then hopefully begin to address. Um, but it, it was an abject lesson, you know, in, how this curate this curatorial effort to bring audiences together with skin in the game um is never ending and um and you never know if you have the right quotient necessarily but some of these more epic mistakes at least for my sake in the sense of missing the mark reinforce our value that the more diverse the audience is the more productive the conversation will be I guess I have a follow-up question, and then yeah. we have a question here where maybe yeah. we can go to it. Um, when, um, in your example, like, what, what would you have prepared in space if that is the case, there is more support? Or, like, if something comes up that people, like, um, you don't want them to leave with, like, you know, actually the opposite of healing. What do you, as a facilitator and director, create in space and prepare for it? So we always have, and uh, inevitably, mental health professionals and other organizations that we're working with who are present in the room, especially when we're addressing questions of trauma so, and mental health. Um, of course, all of our projects touch upon that sub those subjects, so, you know, um, we try to have them present at all performances. 
Um, having done now uh, more than 1,300 performances for over 250,000 audience members, there have been a few instances over that 12 year period where someone has become so activated they needed acute uh, mental health care. But then we're talking about a very small fraction of people over hundreds of thousands of people over the span of 12 years. Um, so in the immediate, we try to take steps to make sure people know that there are people in the room to whom they can speak and resources they can access if they start feeling they need to. Um, in the long term, we try to connect people with available local and national resources um, that they might act upon. Because one of the theories of change behind what we do is that most of us walk around trying to compartmentalize all of these experiences and feelings um, and it may be a theatrical experience or a communal experience that opens us to the possibility that we should talk to somebody. Um, full disclosure, I'm the son of two psychologists. Um, I believe my mother's uh, in the Zoom somewhere and I saw her a few minutes ago. And, you know, I, I just take it as an article of faith and I know that Americans do. I don't necessarily think that Europeans do um, in our experience of performing in other countries, but I think Americans, even in the reddest of red states, because of the crucible of Vietnam, because of the anguish that many Americans are feeling in almost all strata, it's not because of COVID, but because of these vast uh, inequities and systems and structures that are causing this immense pain, um, people want to talk about it. They want, they want a pretext, they want permission, they want to be empowered to have these conversations. And we provide a vocabulary for talking about it that lasts way longer than the performance itself, um, but creates this space in the room where people can talk about it and they can do, about, do it in a way that's not coercive. They can talk about the characters. I really related to that character because X, Y, and Z, or they can step out from behind the archetypes and the characters, they can talk about themselves. You know, I am that character, and here's why. But it's their choice. No one is asking them follow-up questions. No one is coercing them to narrate their trauma. No one is um, pushing them. We're just validating whatever comes up and then creating the conditions for the conversation to continue. Um, so we have uh, receptions often following our performances where people who represent things like the mayor's office to combat uh, domestic violence are engaging with people who've just experienced uh, a play about domestic violence and people are being signed up for appointments at the Family Justice Center the next morning where they're beginning escape planning, exit planning to get out of relationships where they are physically threatened. If you had told me 15 years ago that theater, um, the consequences of performing a reading of a play could be of life and death for audience members who receive it, I'd say that's ridiculous, it's hyperbolic but I can't tell you the number of people who come up to us after performances or, or even months or years later tracked us down and said, it was the first time I spoke to my spouse. It was the first time my father opened up. It was, um, I was thinking about uh, taking my own life and I sought help and it saved my life. I, I saw myself reflected in the character on stage and realized I had a problem and checked myself into a 28 day alcohol substance abuse treatment program. We've even had people who were plotting acts of violence come forward and get help uh, and acknowledge what they were plotting, where we know we've averted acts of violence. And I know this is all anecdotal, um, but for me, it, I, don't, I don't need evidence because I see it every night um, of the incredibly positive net effect of creating conditions where people can speak about and unburden themselves about these really challenging topics. And even if people walk away uncomfortable or perturbed or unresolved, because we're not gonna put a bow on a conversation. We're not gonna be like, well, we've solved systemic racism, you know, and, and people can just go home. Um, I wish. You know, what we say at the end of every performance is, um, uh, after an early performance, uh, someone stood up and said, uh, an answer to one of my questions, why do you think the playwright wrote the play? Um, Sophocles, in this instance, the person said, I think he wrote the play to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And um, uh, I think 
that is, that's that's the that's the mission of theater board productions we can do both at the same time we can valid can validate people's distress their emotional trauma their feeling of unease and we can also make people who aren't paying attention to their own complicit role in the suffering of other people we can afflict them with a new consciousness about how we all interrelate in our interdependency um, and, and the hope is that for those who come from privileged places who attend our performances that you know they don't think of it something like well I can check that box I saw Antigone and Ferguson they, they actually get activated and get involved in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise. Ryan, um, there's there's a bunch of questions that are fantastic in the chat, and but I just I just wanted to ask one really quick question. Maybe you can respond to it. Just in terms of the 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 ability that you have to offer these free or even you know more than free performances comes a lot in part from your funding, and and I just was hoping that you could talk about how it's been and what you feel feel like it's been to work with inside institutions like. New York State, like the military, to be a defense contractor, to have these, you know, million dollar contracts with the government, and your position on like working inside that system, as opposed to seeking funding elsewhere, and kind of maybe dealing with the same issues from the outside, as opposed to working within Rikers, for instance. Yeah, I see. I mean, I'm not going to be able to answer. That's a great question. I'm going to try to be succinct in, in my response. I'm also looking at some of these really yeah. great questions yeah. on the chat. Yeah. So take whatever um, question, Brian. Well, I think it can split the difference between some of it. You know, I, I hear in your question, this question about, can we be engaged with these institutions, especially these like hugely problematic ones, like the industrial military complex or um, the prison industrial complex and achieve anything. I mean, uh, and, what, and, and are we not becoming in some ways complicit if we're doing anything that humanizes the activity of these of these institutions, and I know I was part of a I, I zoom I t tuned into a zoom on abolition of of jails recently on a couple weeks ago here um, with the rail and you know notions of um, what is what is radical and what is liberal um, were being discussed. Um, from our perspective, uh, um, there's nothing more radical than getting down into the trenches and getting your hands dirty and being seen by other artists and other activists as potentially complicit in order to actually achieve some larger goal. And it's a, sometimes it's a very lonely place to be. Um, and so for instance, I, I cite by that, um, you know, one of our performances that you mentioned was um, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And I'm looking at one of the questions that was being asked by a former military analyst on the chat where he says, you know, how can we make a safe space for war fighters while still maintaining a brave space to speak truth to power? So we were in Guantanamo Bay at the headquarters, having performed in the camps for the guards, and later that day at, at the headquarters. And we had in the audience, the CIA, the FBI, um, we had um, Marines who guard the border, we had um, detention ops who work in the camps, many of them, 18, 19 year olds who get six weeks of Pashto and some cultural um, training and they're thrown into situations in which they are ill prepared and, and intellectually far less sophisticated than the people they're engaging with. And, um, and we had that diversity in the room. We had other people as well. And we had General Kelly, uh, people may remember who is one of Trump's chiefs of staff, um, uh, not Joint Chiefs, but Chief, and also an Admiral. And the diversity of response in the room to the play Prometheus Bound that we were performing at CIA, I mean, sorry, at um, Guantanamo, was um, as profound as one could imagine. Um, uh, Prometheus is a play widely interpreted as a sort of condemnation of unrightful imprisonment and authoritarian rule so that we were even able to do it at Gitmo at all was kind of a coup um, but they would see it as productive to actually face you know how the outside world might view them even if they didn't elect to to do this job and um, so briefly and this is shameless plug explicated far more extensively in my book the theater of war um, 
we had, when I asked the question, who's Prometheus? Have you ever met Prometheus? This iconic martyr and prisoner chained to a rock at the end of the earth. Uh, the, 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 the response was as diverse as, um, I'm Prometheus from a guard. I'm chained to this rock at the end of the earth. I'm judged by everyone, including other people, even in the military for an assignment I didn't raise my hand for. I feel totally conflicted and abandoned and isolated. And it's our position that if someone is in that position, if we as artists or as social impact theater makers aren't engaged with them in the trenches, then we're also complicit and responsible for what they do in that isolation. Um, if we're not engaging with people as human beings, if we constantly are adopting the rhetoric of dehumanization uh, in service of sort of asserting our political superiority. So that was said, uh, a Marine talked about wanting to get the detainees back on enemy soil after hearing about um, an altercation that took place between a detainee and one of the guards. Um, several other really shocking things were said that were totally disturbing. And then finally, at the end of this conversation, when I asked the question, who wins in this play when at the end of Prometheus Bound, Prometheus is buried in rock and becomes the most iconic martyr of all time, having provoked in his captors this uh, immoral response. And before I could finish asking the question, the Jack lawyer who uh, was waiting to speak in the front said, I'm so glad you asked that, this judge advocates lawyer at Guantanamo, we have lost all moral authority in this war and we will never regain it until we give the detainees here due process and fair trials. Um, at the end of the day, everyone was entitled to their opinion and was able to express it forcefully because we were just interpreting a play. And um, so uh, in a lot of contexts, when we're able to bring the chief of police of Baltimore together with frontline activists, um, because the play is not threatening, we can create the conditions for truth to be spoken to power and in front of power in ways that um, I think the rhetoric of activism, which is often a sort of one-way stream of very passionate speech, doesn't necessarily allow for. Everyone's frozen, but hopefully someone's gonna mm -hmm. chime in. Um, Brian, do you see any other question you wanna take or we should go for one? Um, yes. Um, Yes, there's a lot of really great stuff here. Um, you know, but we are at the 151 mark, so maybe we should open it up to people who um, want to be seen and heard. Um, uh, I'm just looking here. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, there's one question that I'm really interested in, but I don't know, Catherine, maybe some people will want to speak directly. But Brian, maybe in between that happenings, you can quickly respond to, is social distancing performative? Can this moment of suspension be potentialized through theatrical agency? Yeah, so thank you so much for that question. We're about to launch our first uh, online performance. Uh, it's gonna happen on May 7th. It's a project called The Oedipus Project. Uh, it's gonna be a reading of Sophocles Oedipus starring Jason Isaac as, uh, sorry, Oscar Isaac as Oedipus. Um, Francis McDormand as Jocasta, John Turturro as Creon, um, all, the list goes on, Frankie Faison, David Strathairn. Um, Oedipus is a story about arrogant leadership, ignored prophecy, and a plague. And it's about a leader who discovers that he is the contagion um, for which he is searching, that is sickening his people. And we're going to open this up to a really diverse audience and we're going to do it on Zoom on the webinar platform. And from my perspective, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit of a Luddite. I work on typewriters. I like to hand write stuff. But I, I, this is the moment to be nimble. This is the moment to adapt. This is where people are convening. As long as we can engage with each other and hear each other's perspectives, I, I, I know it's going to work. And um, my colleagues, uh, Marjolaine Goldsmith, who's our company manager, is also on this call. Dominic Dupont, who's our uh, community liaison. You know, what we're going to be working on together over the next uh, three weeks is, you know, how do we optimize Zoom to actually uh, empower audiences to do the very thing that we do in live settings, 
um, through digital performances and convenings. And of course, there are things we lose with Zoom, and there are actually things I think that we gain. And, um, and the good news is we can really democratize this form um, you know, by opening it up to even larger groups of people, and we can do really targeted, curated audiences. Um, you know, I see enormous potential in the present moment. Of course, the hunger for connection is even more profound than it was before COVID. Um, and I think for theater artists, there is unlimited work to be done in the present moment. No one should be sitting on their hands because as long as we can access each other in some way, there's no reason we shouldn't be applying our trade. And people are asking how they can uh, be uh, like um, told by uh, when is the performance, the reading on the Zoom, where can they find it? They're going to be able to find information now early next week on our website, theaterofwar.com, where they'll be able to register. Um, I suggest checking in next Wednesday um, when we'll have all of our ducks in a row. Um, we don't, uh, if you've been to a previous Theater of War event before, you'll get an email from us via Eventbrite for registration as well. Um, and of course, you can reach out to Brooklyn Rail because they'll be helping us promote it, I'm sure, as well. Great. And I think we have uh, Lauren who would like to talk to you, and we will unmute her. <laughs> Do we have Hi. Lauren? Hi. Um, yeah, I, actually, I don't want to take any more of your time. You, you already answered my question. So just to say thank you so much, and I'm totally on, inspired. Wonderful. Well, it's great to hear your voice, Lauren. Thank you for the affirmation. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so it looks like we have a couple of other good questions, particularly from Kaz uh, Guchani. Um, I will unmute you now if you're comfortable voicing your question. Just Thank one you. moment. Yeah. Okay, you're unmuted. Hi, Kaz. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you do, Brian. I think it's very important. And fundamentally, I would like, uh, you know, I, I agree with you about not uh, having a non-transactional relationship, spe specifically with the audience and the population that you work. But being a fundraiser myself and a yes. producer of uh, the small festival that we have, which is, you know, artist run individual, it's called them Roots Festival. How do we ensure sus sustainable, you know, how, how to make sure it's sustainable for the long run if we don't sort of sell things? How can we ensure to, uh, we have enough funding to support our artists and the community to, to get engaged uh, with, with our conversation? I really thank you for that question. Um, Kaz, I am, um, Theater of War Productions is a for-profit model. Um, we're for-profit because we want to remain nimble, because we don't want to be beholden to individual wealth, which is the primary structural problem of nonprofits, as I see it. There's only so far you can push against structures of oppression when those structures are actually protecting the wealth and the privilege of the very people who might be on your board. And um, so um, we, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, most of our funding comes through large institutional contracts, the Department of Defense, the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Drug Abuse and Addiction, um, major foundation funding that passes through to us by way of fiscal partners like the Brooklyn Public Library, um, where we're not burdened with nonprofit management, which I think can take up 99% of your time if you're trying to actually affect any change. One of the things, I came from the nonprofit world before this, and I swore to myself that I would neither manage nor be managed. I would get a group of people who were, had enough judgment and uh, intelligence to really push things without my having to manage them every second. And I also would not create a structure where I would have to be managed by a board, and that has allowed us to be nimble and to make all these decisions. It's not an easy answer. I'm not, I, I'm not saying you wave a magic wand. The way we've been able to raise millions and millions of dollars for what we do, and then be able to make these decisions about paying our artists way more than scale, and offering meals and transportation to our audiences, not starting with free as some kind of pat on the back, but really pushing beyond it, um, is by making the argument 
that this thing that we're doing is of service. And that is not a binary from my perspective with being, having artistic integrity. I don't, I'm not really interested in that argument. You can have the highest level of integrity and still do something that's meaningful and of service for the community that goes beyond simply the service of producing culture and offering it to the community. And I think when the argument is made that we are meeting these needs and our process starts from who is the audience and what are their needs, then we've been able to find totally novel ways to raise enormous amounts of money to support our work from funders who would never fund the arts. And so I know it's not a cookie cutter answer. I do think I really appreciate what you're saying because it is a moral failing on the part of artistic directors worldwide to be beholden to a ticket-based model. And the burden is on us to raise the funds and answer the question. It's already, we live in a culture that doesn't value culture and we're not getting subsidy from the state very much. So it's already impossible situation. Um, I feel that the opportunity of COVID-19 is to scrap the existing structures and start again with a very large scale in the United States WPA Federal Works Initiative. Germany just gave $50 billion to artists and writers to stimulate that sector of their economy. I think we could do more. And when our coffers are actually flush to the extent they should be, um, then we can act in accordance with our values. And, that, and those values should be not being beholden to late capitalism, not making art in a commodity, but actually treating it as a natural resource, a service, that you know has all kinds of infinite net benefits for the communities that we engage with and perform for. Uh, I'm not going to tie a bow on that answer. We are at two o'clock, and we promised ourselves that this would be a tight hour. <laughs> and I know people have uh, all kinds of other more pressing things to get to with their lives, but we really, really hope you'll come to the Oedipus Project on May seventh, and we'll be sending out information and posting it. Engage with our work online. Then we cannot cannot wait till the day when I know I speak for Marjolaine, Dominic, myself, all my colleagues, and we can engage with you all in a live place again with song, dance, discussion, when we can be uncomfortable together and share the same space. But it's been um, in this virtual space, a real honor to share space and time with you this afternoon. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Shadi and Lucas so much. This was a really really thoughtful conversation and i just want to point out there were so many good questions in the chat you can download the chat if you type on the little um, ellipses um, at the bottom so you can read those questions later um, and lucas and shadi was there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up with our poem I just want to thank you, Brian, for your time and like a lovely, lovely conversation. And thank you, everyone else who stayed with us until 2 p.m. to listen to the conversation. Yeah, thank you all. And thank you, Marjolaine and Dominique, for all your work. Yeah, really good. Thank you all. Okay, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, remember to join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, with a conversation at the same time with Hetty Jones and Bob Holman. Um, and now we'll end with our daily ritual um, with a poem. And our poem today will be read by Lewis Block, our production manager. Hi, everyone. I'll be reading uh, from Soap by Francis Ponge. And this is just an excerpt of the much longer poem. This egg, this flat dab, this little almond, which grows so quickly, almost instantly into a Chinese fish, with its veils and kimonos and wide sleeves. Thus it celebrates its marriage with water. Such is the gown of its marriage with water. One would never be through with soap, yet it is necessary to return it to its saucer, to its strict appearance, its austere oval, its dry patience, and its power to serve again. Thank you. Thank you, you Sadi. Lucas, thank you, Brian. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Shadi Lucas. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Brian. Thank you. Thank Remember you to much join much. us tomorrow at yeah. 1 p.m. I just want to say one last thing is that it's true. During the Greek time, all theater experience was free to all public. So what you're doing there have a very profound meaning and it's very radical and pioneer. So 
thank you so much for the work you're doing, Brian. And thank well, the you. The feeling is mutual, Fong. And you're keeping the rail free is a statement of your values, and I applaud it, and I'm so delighted to be part of it in some small way. Well, thank you, buddy. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Let's support each other. That's what we'll we see each other soon. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Sadi. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.